I want to talk to you, continue just out of my heart. And again, as I told you in the past, uh, we'll still do series as the Lord leads and we'll still do, you know, at the movies. Hey, at the movies is coming this fall. So how many of you enjoy at the movies? It's coming back at a church near you. And, uh, and so uh, uh, Christmas show, Easter, all those things, they're still going to do those things. But for the most part, uh, I want to just minister to you out of what the overflow of my heart and specifically the things that, that have helped me in my own spiritual life and to bring more of a practical side and, and give you more kind of stories and, and relational ways to, uh, to actually uh, to, uh, to understand these things in a way to where you can apply them in your own life. And for probably the next several months, in one way or another, I'm going to be talking to you about, about what amounts to what I like to call uh, the, the impossibility triangle. And like the Bermuda Triangle, you know, the, the, the legends are things go into the Bermuda Triangle and they disappear. I, I would have loved my report cards to find the Bermuda Triangle, but they didn't seem to get there. But, but the impossibility triangle for a Christian is where the impossibilities of your life can go away. God has called you to live in the impossible. And most of us live our lives in the survival. Or for nothing better than what lives and dies with us on the earth. And I want to talk to you about what does it mean to live in that? How do you actually do this? What does it actually mean? How do you live this out in your everyday life? Because God truly wants you to live in the presence of his purpose of your life. So when we talk to you about knowing the love of God, it's because without knowing he loves you, 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 you'll never understand his purpose. And we talk to you about knowing God and then finding freedom, discovering your purpose and making an impact. We're not talking about doing that within the, the capacity of your own ability alone. But I want you to understand there are three spiritual forces that every believer is called to walk in. And when these triangulate and come together in your life, impossibilities vanish. Now, I'd love to tell you that Michelle and I have walked in this, in, in this triangle our whole life. We haven't. And, and, but the times we have, and we, and we really do seek to do this. We, just like you, we strive to do these things. But I want you to understand them clearly. And basically, there's just three values that I'm going to be spending, these three sp spiritual, scriptural things that every believer has in their life, that if you know how they work together, can change everything in your world and cause you to live a life that is actually in partnership with the God of all creation. And I don't mean that in some kind of religious term. I mean in real life and every day of your life. And it's grace and faith and humility. Grace in the Bible is defined as the supernatural power of God that comes to you that you can't earn. It's divine capacity, divine power, and divine strength. So I'd love to have some of that. Do you know that when you gave your life to Jesus, the scripture says in Ephesians 4 that to every one of us who have named Christ as the Lord of our life, that Jesus himself, now listen, Jesus himself has given you a measure of the grace that was upon him when he walked the earth. Now, this is very important. When Jesus, the Bible said, when he ascended, he gave gifts or deposits of grace to men and women. Every Christian on the earth has been apportioned by the head of the church, Jesus, a measure of divine grace on their life. And it has within it literally an assignment for you. Because we are called members of the body of Christ. There's not one part of the human body that does not have a distinct assignment, does not have a distinct enablement and empowerment to do a job. And I would suggest to you, and I would tell you this with, with overwhelming sadness, most Christians live and die, and they never step one day into that grace. They live their whole life trapped in a natural world trying to achieve success or get through life or whatever. So grace is supernatural divine endowment. Faith is being governed by what you believe. You say, well, I, I don't know that I have faith. Everybody has faith. Everybody is governed by a set of beliefs. Those beliefs, however, just may not be formed by the word of God. The Bible tells us that grace and peace is multiplied, multiplied, multiplied to you through the knowledge of God. That's why it's so critical that you have a life where you feed on the word of God on a daily basis podcast, listening to things, read the scripture, come to church, get in a small group, lead a small group. I'm, I'm kind of busy for that. You're way too busy. 
And I'm going to show you how easy for all of us it is to step outside of this triangle. Faith is what you believe. The Bible tells us we're to walk by faith. We're to live by faith. It's the governance of your life. Faith is when you let what God's Word says govern the way you think, govern the way you talk. You judge the decisions you make, not based on what you feel, not based on the circumstances of your life, but you judge what you think, how you, what you act upon based on what God says about you. And the third part of it is humility. Humility is what you choose to bring low. Pride is what you choose to exalt. When we walk by faith, what we are choosing to bring low is our, are our circumstances. They say, you can't do this. This won't work. That can't happen. Your marriage is here. Your kid. And, and yet, if God's word says differently, I have to take what I see, what I feel. And those things are not unimportant, by the way. You don't deny feelings. That's not what faith does. But it doesn't honor them. And it says, no matter what I feel, I bring those below what God has says. And I humble myself and I... And I exalt what God says about me. That's humility. And I want you to see what happens when you walk in that triangle. Look at James chapter 4, verse 6. In James 4, verse 6, James wrote these words as a pastor. He said, but he, God, gives us more grace. How many of you would like more divine capacity in your life? This is why the scripture says this. God opposes or resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Is there anybody here that you say, you know what I want to be today? I want to be in a position where God has to resist me or oppose me. Remember, remember this, grace, grace cannot be earned, but it is not unconditional. God respects what I choose. And when you find out, and when you see my hope today, when you find how easy it is to walk in pride, and if you'll define pride as the Bible does, it can really revolutionize the way you process your life. And for, for many of you in this room, you'll learn how to actually li live beyond the overwhelming circumstances that you face today, the overwhelming emotions that come with them, even the depression that might be backdoored to these things. They're not, none of those are insignificant. None of those are minimized, but none of those need to define your life. And here's what he said. God opposes the proud <clears throat> or re resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Verse 7 says, submit yourself. That's an act of faith. Submit yourself then to God. That's a choice. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is your choice. Come near to God and then he will come near to you. What's he saying? God respects your choice. He's showing that humility is you choosing and he's showing you the response of God to the humility and choice of an individual. And then now he shows you the other side. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is usually not the verse people want for their morning devotion. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Then he says, humble yourself. Say it out loud. Humble yourself. God doesn't humble you. Don't ever say, Lord, I pray the Lord's humbling me. The Lord's gonna... God doesn't humble anybody. You get to either humble yourself or not. He said, now, if you'll humble yourself before the Lord, now listen, listen, then he will lift you up. Not God just in this vague. God himself, the maker of the universe, will come into your individual life. <clears throat> and God himself will put his hand on you and will lift you up. And can I tell you when the hand of God and the grace, that, this is how grace works. When grace, divine capacity, falls in a situation, in a family, in a person, in a marriage, in whatever, it will lift them beyond any human background, any human tragedy, any, any mistakes, sins against them, sins. Nothing can stop a person. Nothing and no one. All the demons in hell can line up and everybody that opposes God can line up 10,000 miles long. In one breath of the grace of God, you will overcome all of them because nothing and no one can stand in the presence of his power. No one. But it's available to all of us. But why does he say something like, like, what's this? We mean wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then he says, grieve, mourn, and wail. I'm like, well, you know, Lord, I, I can do a lot of that without Jesus. <laughs> then he says, change your laughter into mourning and change your, your joy into gloom. What's he saying? I want you to take everything in your life 
that you have exalted above my grace. Not just all the good and all, all the bad, but all the good. I want you to put confidence in, forget human ability. Stop living your life, he's saying, trusting in yourself. He said, if you think, as you pursue your own means and mechanisms of happiness, as you seek to be happy on your own, well, if we do this, and, and do you know why most people get married? They think marriage is supposed to make them happy. How many of you found out that isn't always the case? <laughs> he said, anything that you have lifted above me, that I told you that if you go this direction, I will lift you up, but you think you have a better way to go, and you think this will bring me laughter, this will bring me joy. He said, you turn that type of laughter and joy, he said, turn it into weeping and mourning. Because what you are doing when you do that is you are walking in pride, and I resist the proud. Why does God resist the proud? Because the scripture said, no flesh can ever glory in the presence of a holy God. You will never, I will never stand before God and give him my list of accomplishments. Everything, anything, everything and anything God ever does in my life or your life is an act of grace and mercy and kindness. You never, grace is unmerited, but it is not unconditional. It requires a choice on my part to humble myself under the mighty hand of God, then he can exalt you, exalt me in due time. Now I want to bring this into an example and, I, and I'll try to push this in, but but I want to take the time and talk to you so you can have an application. And some of you have heard parts of this, but there's a part of this that I've never really shared publicly. But, I, but it's in my heart to start to talk more about these things so that you can understand how this triangle works, how divine capacity can come into a situation that is impossible and change it. Years ago, when we were back at our old location on the other side of, of Cranberry Township, Victory started 25 years ago, and we, had, we built our first building over uh, off of Freedom Road. While we were there, the church was growing, and I mean, literally, people were, were in closets on, on the staff. It was, it was, we had so outgrown the building, it was crazy. There was a wonderful family in our church, and, and honestly, they didn't stay long. I don't remember them, their names, but th they came to me, and they said, we have a 90 plus acre farm in New Swickley Township. If Victory will build its, its future there, we'll give it to the church for free. Now, how many of you know free is a great word? So my first inclination is, oh, that's fantastic. I was so excited. Now I did what all the you know, pastors are supposed to say, well, let's pray about it. I, I wasn't praying about it. I just said that because you have to, right? So I didn't go to prayer. I actually went to the Lord and just started to thank. I said, Lord, thank you so much for that. Thank you for that land. I, I, Lord, I, I don't know how we would ever get the kind of land to do what you call it because I knew it was in our heart to do. And every time I'd go to pray about it, my heart had, was just wasn't clear. It was like, there's something wrong with this. Now, I can't tell you this has happened every day in my life, but I can tell you that, I don't know, in 35 years of walking with God, I can probably tell you 15, I don't know, 20 times that I can tell you that I know that I know that it wasn't like a witness in my heart. I kind of feel like the Lord's saying, and, and I prayed out and walked it through. This was like somebody sitting beside you. And, and when, when that interaction finished, like I had, a, I had a conversation, it was that real to me. It was a knowing on the inside of me that was as clear as I'm looking with you today. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And I hope that you understand what I mean by that. It wasn't like John, da, da, da. it was a knowing like that. I said, I don't want that. And then he spoke these words to me. I want you to trust me for the land that Walmart wants. And I felt bad. I, got, I was like, oh, my God. Walmart. You have to understand, in, in, when, when this was happening, Walmart was like Amazon. It's still a juggernaut. But Walmart was the Amazon of the world. It was, and I'm thinking, Walmart land? They can have anything they want. That's the most expensive piece of real estate in a community. It's the most advantageous. It's the easiest to get to. It is the perfect place to get. God, we're a church of five, 600 people. Now, now, God does not want to partner with you to do the practical. Now, you may not, you're not called perhaps to do ministry like I am. But can I tell you that the purpose of God for your life will face equal impossibilities as I'm about to share with you? Now, I had a decision to make at that moment as the leader of this ministry. I could honor God and humble myself, or I could give you 50 reasons why that's impossible. And everybody I would have given the reasons to would have said, absolutely. 
And so instead of doing, this is where humility comes. This is where faith, governing, because it's the governance of what you believe, coupled with the humility to take everything you feel and say it, you will not be my God, you will not be my Lord. I'm going to honor and obey God. I know this is impossible. But what happens when you enter that triangle with a, a, an action of faith and humility? He said, I give you more grace. And divine capacity began to show up after the faith and the humility was acted upon, not before. When I walked on this property, Michelle and I walked this property, we, we started looking. He said, well, where did you look? Only land that I thought Walmart would want. And this is what it looked like when we walked on it, those I guess 20 years ago, it was all trees. He said, I'm an environmentalist. Well, we killed them all. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said that out loud, didn't I? I'm sorry. No, I don't believe in killing trees. I, I love trees, love trees, love, love trees. And we ended up buying 64 acres all the way up to where today Penn Detroit Diesel is in our southernmost property. You can see where the parking lot ends. When we walked on this property, I knew in my heart, this is what I want. Now, now you understand, I'm here, he's there. And I don't, it's not like I have a background for any of this stuff. I don't know how to develop land. I don't know any of this stuff. And I'm like, Lord, this is 64, the land cost $2.4 million. The land, just the land. We don't have to forget a building. But in my heart, he said, that's what I want. Oh, now I have a choice every time. You walk with God in your life. You're going to have a choice. You will have a choice to exalt what you feel, whether God's dealing with your heart about something or the word of God says something over your life. And you're going to get to choose what you exalt in your life. I, I, you don't have to, this isn't about perfection. This isn't about you being greatly spiritual. This is about an act of humility where divine capacity comes into a person's life that in no way, shape, form, or fashion could ever do ever do in a million years what they're being asked to do. That's the God and that's the relationship your father wants to have with you in your everyday life and in the areas of your life that may have been trapped for generations in darkness. He wants all of the areas of our life that are, that are unlike, unlike what God's plan and will and Christ likeness and his mercy, kindness, grace, goodness, redemption. He wants all those areas to enter that triangle and all of the, all those barriers to die and disappear. Well, we ended up having to invest another $2.4 million to make it look like this. Now, if you can put up the next slide, we're $5 million in. That's what it looks like. We're a church of under 1,000 people. People who have lined up 1,000 deep and said, you're out of your mind. And by the way, they started to. I had people in the township, very kind and good people, privately try to pull me aside and tell me I was over my head. Because we would go to meetings and they'd use terms. And by this time, I, I was the one leading it. I, I was doing the best I could. And I, they'd say terms. I said, well, what does that mean? And they're like, oh, well, this is not. <laughs> oh, it's like going to a brain surgeon, right? That's in the room consulting. And they go with a cranium and you go, what's a cranium? <laughs> so the, the couple, one guy particularly, very nice man, pulled me aside. He said, called me Reverend Simpson. He doesn't do that anymore. I hate that name. And he said, man, listen, I. I know what y'all are trying to do up there because we have to, they knew our plans. The, the, the out parcels you're wanting to sell, we're right now where, where car sense is. He said, it's going to be at least 10 years before those are going to sell for any valuable money. And, and I, it just, the township's growing on Route 228 and, and he tried to say, and, and, he, and he was being polite to me. And, and so we hit this wall and it was a wall. And then the, then the bank came and said this, we're not loaning you any more money, period. Now, we, we had already paid off the 2.4 million, but the bank was like, we're done. Now, I, I, my personal feeling is the bank, when they knew the plan that we had, they also looked at me and the group that was there when they got to the underwriters said this. I don't know this is true. I think it's what happened. They said, there's no way in the world this crazy guy in this church is ever going to do this. And we are invested in this land. This is an amazing piece of land. It's perfectly ready right now. Let's not fund this stupid little church thing. It'll ruin the whole property. I don't know if that happened. That's just my feeling. But if I were on their side of the ledger, I may not have thought any differently. Why? Because they're looking at what anyone would look at and say, you guys are out of your mind. But faith and humility says, 
I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what my, if I know that God has spoken to my heart, then I will go to my grave to honor him. I'm okay dying failing, but I'm not okay dying giving fear the lordship of my, I won't do it. Because I don't want to go to heaven with people not there because I was afraid to trust God. I can't, I can't live that way. I, can't, I can live with failure. I can't live with that. Well, when we got to the point to where the land, go ahead and you put it back up. The land looked like this, that final development piece. There we go. It looked like that. And guys, thank you. They do a great job. I'm just teasing. That, when it looked like that and it all fell apart, the bank put these conditions on us. Every out parcel that you have for sale has to be sold before we'll loan you another penny. And the building you're currently in has to sell now. Now understand, it's like living in your house and the bank says, Here, here's when you can start looking for a house after you sell yours. Now, I'm not talking about a contingency. But you, don't give a, you don't have a house to move into for two years because it takes time to build a building. So it's impossible. And I don't blame anybody who looked at this and said it's crazy, impossible, impossible. There was an individual that was an integral part of my life at that point. And, and by the way, we're still friends today and there are no problems with this. But I want to tell you honestly what happened. He pulled me aside and he said, uh, he said, I can't go to the church anymore. I, I have to leave. Because he, he was kind of in, involved in the intricacies of it. He said, listen, this is impossible and you're going to destroy this. And uh, I, I just can't be a part. I can't watch this happen. I can't be a part of it. And so he left. And, and, and just so you know, I don't disagree with what he was seeing. From his expertise, he was 100% right. And I want, I want you to understand, and I didn't say this with any kind of uh, arrogance. I said it with, with compassion because I understood. I understood what he was feeling. I felt every bit of it. And I called him by name and I said, listen, I don't disagree with you. But here's what I know. In a few short years, I'll be dead. And I'll stand before God. And I will give an account for the grace he put on my life. And unless you can stand in judgment for me, I'm more concerned about honoring the call of God than disappointing you. I don't disagree with you. Everything you said, I agree with 100%. 100%. And he left. And I, and I understood it. And we're friends today. And don't, there's no issue to that. If I were on the other side of the ledger, I may have done the exact same thing. Everybody understands I'm not criticizing this person. Does everyone understand that? He, he was just, man, he was looking at it going, yeah, this is crazy. It's done. From that time, now this is what happened in three months. Three months. I'm trying to show you how impossibilities disappear in this triangle. Can I tell you that every one of those decisions was like someone pulling my fingernails out. Everything in me was saying, this is, you can't do this. This is not... But I knew in my heart that this is what he's called us to do. And so you keep walking and everything around you keeps screaming. Humility is when the screams, you go, no, you won't govern my life. Let God be true and every man a liar. And you humble yourself. And Jesus in the scripture said, when you do that, I give you more divine capacity. Three months, this is what happened. Three months. A church bought our old church and leased it back to us. This happened in three months. Bought our building. We put this, this land on the market. And right before it was going to go on the market, I called the guy who was the broker. And it was going to go on the market, I believe, for $2.4 million, all the out parcels together. The night before he was going to release the email, I called him. And I said, listen, I've been praying. And I feel like we're supposed to list it for $3.5 million, just adjust all the out parcels to make that number. He said, well, John, and he's very honest about it. And he was right. He said, John, that's not how real estate works. It's already going to be tough to sell these. I mean, it's next, you know, the timing, it's going to be very, it's hard. These are, it's going to take time to sell these. You overprice in a market, you're done. I said, I understand that. I'm not an agent, but I, but I am, a, but, but I know what's in my heart. And he said, I, I'll change the numbers. And he did. Now that he changed the numbers in three months, three months, that building was sold and that land sold for $3.35 million. Three months, Done. <laughs> Completely done, property paid off, no debt, gone. Now, if you looked and didn't know anything, you'd say, man, that guy's, well, he's clever. <laughs> no one watching it felt clever. I'm trying to show you what happens in everyday life when somebody walks in that triangle. And if you come to this church, every time you drive on here, 
you drive on to the impossible. And every time you go to that red light, that costs seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> Twitch. Let me let me pivot here, and then we're going to kind of wind down. What most Christians desire from God and what they pray for to receive from God differs very little from what an atheist would want to have in their life apart from God. Help me be well, help my family, help my finances, help my problems, help my emotions. And their whole life is focused on God helping them live here. And what I want to do is take you into how I process my spiritual life. I sit down, when I read the Bible, I see myself sitting down talking to Jesus and he talks to me. And I put it in that context when I read it. And these are the things I would hear him say in my heart that he's saying to you as well. Is that John, I put my grace on your life, not just to, not just to live for these, these things that, that are just going to go away. Not, none of these things aren't important in the Bible. God, these matter to God deeply. All these things I just mentioned. He said, but John, I, 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 didn't, I didn't purchase you with my blood so you could pay a bill and go on a vacation and have a, a body that would be well. And that's, do you understand, son? I, 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 I made you my own, a part of my body because I want to live through you. I have a purpose. I took the grace on my life, son, and I took a portion of it and I put it on you. It is supernatural and it will do things in your life that you will never, it's unimaginable what I can do if you will yield to me. Son, please, 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 please don't live for your own joy. Please don't live for your own laughter. It will turn to mourning. You'll never live the life I called you to live that way ever, John. Don't do it. Don't do it. I want to teach you how to live in the fullness of my kingdom, not your kingdom. And I'm going to take you to Matthew 6, and I'm going to read this to you the way I read the Bible to myself. And I want you to learn how to, ch you get to make a choice, guys. Oh, I hope the Lord, there's so much that's within God's hands, but there's so much in your hands. The choice to walk by faith, the choice to submit to God, the choice to walk in humility, to humble yourself before God is not in the hands of God. It is in the hands of you and me. We get to choose. And that choice is what initiates more grace. Draw near to God, he draws near to you. And you begin to have a cycle of divine enablement and divine enablement and divine enablement. And it goes into every area of your life. Grace doesn't fill up a cylinder. It, it's like pouring it on the floor. It goes into every nook and cranny of your life. And it will change areas of your life that you thought impossible. But it will happen by divine capacity. Let me read to you from Matthew 6. This is what Jesus, and this is how I would read it. I'm going to put my name in there. You put yours in there. John, listen to me. Where your money is, where your treasure is. John, that's where your heart is also. John, the, the light of your body is your eye. And if your eye is single or undivided, your whole body, John, is going to be full of light. But if your eye is evil or divided, your whole body is going to be full of darkness. And John, if the light that is in you becomes darkness, how great will be that darkness? John, you're not going to be able to serve two masters. For you're either going to hate the one and love the other. You're going to hold the one, despise the other. John, listen to me. Listen to me. This is Jesus talking. John, please hear me. Please. You cannot. You cannot, John. You cannot. Not you might not. Not nine out of ten times like the dentist gum thing. You cannot serve or be divided between God and money. Is he saying money's bad? No, no, no. He's saying, John, you can't live for what you think you can gain and what these things can bring you. That's not what your life is about. He's trying to say, he's, he's saying, don't, wherever you put your money, John, your heart is there. He said, please, son, look at how you're living your life. And then verse 25, he, he said, therefore, now because of these issues, I'm telling you something. Listen to me. John, take no thought for your life. Don't worry about your life. Not what you're going to eat or what you drink or even yet for your body and what you're going to put on. John, isn't your life more than food and your body more than clothing? Do you think I died for you so you could eat and go to bed at night and then clothing and go do this and go do this? Do you think I died for you to live on the earth and that's what you're going to live for? He said, verse 26, he said, John, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow. Neither do they reap. They don't even gather into barns. But do you see how your heavenly father feeds them? John, aren't you better than a bird? You're better than a bird. No matter what the environmentalists think, you're better than a bird. 
How do you know that? Jesus said so. Verse 27, which of you, John, by taking thought or by worry, can add one inch or cubit to your statue? Stature. John, do you realize all the work you do, you can't make it, you can't make your body grow. I do that. Now, worry will shrink you, but that's another story for another day. It really will. It'll shrink your body. You will actually shrink in life physically. And then he said this, so John, why are you taking so much attention of your life, thought for your life, worry for your life about these externals, your clothing? He said, look at the lilies of the field. Look how they grow. They don't work or toil. They don't spin. But I'm telling you, even Solomon in all of his glory, John, was not dressed like one of these flowers. Do you understand that if your father who so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into an oven, do you not know that he'll much more want to clothe you? And then he'd say this to me, John, do you know how little faith you have if you think this way? Do you know what is governing your life that is so contrary to how I made you? So therefore, John, I'm telling you, don't take thought. Don't give your life's attention to these externals only of what you're going to eat and drink and put on. And listen to this statement. John, don't you know that everything you're, that every, all, every bit of that is what the Gentiles seek for? And a Gentile is someone that didn't know God. He said, John, if you live this way, you're no different than a person who doesn't even know me. Now, listen to the next sentence, and I'm going to wind this down today. He goes on to say, John, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, and here's the amazing, he said, don't you know, John, your heavenly father, he knows you need these things. But he's telling you not to be the one to have to go figure it all out. But I'm going to tell you what he is telling you to do, son. I'm going to tell you that if you'll live this way, you won't just deal, have those things met, but you will live a life where my purpose for you and our laboring together is going to come together and this amazing thing is going to happen. Jesus said it this way, but seek first, say it out loud first. This is not an option. This is the son of God speaking to me. John, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. The things are not unimportant to God. He's trying to show you this, this choice of walking by faith, living in humility and more grace coming. Most people think marriage is to make you happy. It's not. It can make you happy, but it won't always make you happy. Here's what I want to ask you today. Jesus said, put my kingdom first in every part of your life, not in some religious sense. John, is my kingdom first? What's that mean? Do you realize most of the scriptures we quote for our own personal benefit and well-being are not written to individuals, they're written to churches, and the context is mainly about doing the work of God and bringing people into the kingdom of God and the earth. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, that's true on a personal level, but it's really saying in the context of bringing the gospel to the world. He said, son, he said, put my kingdom first. That's what I saved you for. And in fulfilling your mission and the grace my life of your, on your life for the kingdom, all this other stuff, that grace will, will divinely enable all those other areas. And, and, and I'll bring it to you without you having to value and devalue your life and to, and to take your values and throw them away and, and, and say things like this. We're too busy making money to serve God right now. You know, we're married, but you know what? We're just not getting along. What made you think? Do you know your marriage you should have a kingdom first? What's the kingdom first application of your marriage? That you represent Christ and the church and that you raise up godly children and you are people who change the world by the grace of God. That's what a marriage is for in the Bible. Not just so you get happy. He said, is my kingdom first in your marriage? How about this one? John, is my kingdom first in your kids? Do you know how many people today the kingdom of God first in their children, Christians, it's irrelevant. The average church person goes to, that goes to church goes 1.3 times a month. This is the question in most homes. Hey, are we going to church this weekend? Why don't you say this? Are we going to walk in pride and resist the grace of God and put God first this week? Or are we going to do our own thing? Nobody says it that way, but that's the question. Because you know the Bible says God's first. Why is he first? It's his name, Alpha, first. He's preeminent in all things. God can't be second. And when I honor who he is, I humble myself, more grace comes. Well, we, you know, I, I just, we're, you know, it's a new season. It's just a different time. People are just too busy. Then they're too busy. I'm too busy to put God first. Listen, darling, you're too busy. 
Please hear me. Outside of this triangle, you are on your own. I'm on my own. He said, I oppose the proud, but I will give grace to the humble. He said, on the first week, the first day of the week, the first day of the week, gather together, my people, come. Now, nothing wrong with watching online. If you can't be here, welcome. But he didn't say, look at me on a phone. He said, come together with my body and recognize that you are members one of another because you are not having church at home by yourself. We have a house church. No, you don't have a house church. You have, a, you have an arm and a foot. You don't have the whole body. He said, I want my body come, put my body together. First of the week, come together. Are you putting kingdom first with your kids? See, this is the act of humility. Well, you, you, you so, we're, we have this game and my, my son has to go to with his trainer and he's eight years old. Well, I think he's going to be a pro athlete. You're probably wrong. But let's assume he is. Then you're setting yourself, your son up for horror because you taught him the world revolves around him. God comes after his athletics and guess what pro athletes go through? Who you better know Jesus and how to put him first and you go into that world. I'm telling you from experience of working with pro athletes, you can't imagine the world that is. I'm trying to show you how simple, see how easy it is? You said, well, what do you say about you? You're here, don't worry about it. You're here, I'm not telling you, to, I'm not telling you, come to church because you must punch a church ticket or God will be unhappy. No, no, it's a first, first principle. Jesus said, John, John, put me first and make my kingdom first in your life. You bring your, get, get your kids up out of bed. I don't want to go today. I'm tired. Monday morning, I don't want to go to school. You have to go to school. It's in, your education is very important. It isn't that it's unimportant. 17 hoops to go to this class, to go to this class, to go to tumbling class, to tumble to the next class so you can go over here and jump through this. And hey, oh, look, it's shiny. You got a star. Nothing wrong with sports. Nothing wrong with giving your kids opportunities. That's a wonderful thing. Just never make it first. Don't teach your kids they're more important than God and their fun and their excitement and their, their sporting event because we want you to win. Get the trophy. What? Come on. Get married and your marriage stinks. Go grab your trophy and go, hey. Now it's nine years old. I hit a home run. That ain't. You need to hit another kind of home run. Look, I'm not saying this to, I'm telling you how easy it is as a human being to look at your own way, your own laughter, your own joy and lift it up above God. He said, I want to be first, John. Put me first. All this stuff, my grace will bring it all to you. Or you could be on your own, do it yourself. Can I tell you, if your children ever needed anything from you as a parent, they needed you to teach them in practice what it means to put God first in your life. I mean, put him first. It doesn't feel right. It's a little bit inconvenient. What's our sleep in day? Get out of your stinking bed. I'm not talking about to come to church. You do it for your job. It's going to pass away. They don't love you. you. You mess up, they kick you out. In the kingdom, you mess up, he rescues you. Come on, man. Put him first. Put him first. Lastly, let me say this. And I know I'm going a little longer today, but you know what? So what? So what? Talking about the rest of your life, your kids, your future. This is so important. Even people talk about, well, I hate when they talk about money in the church. Then you hate the Bible. Do you know tithing is not about money? Tithing is not about a tenth. Tithing is about what comes first. God said, everything that comes to you, son, the first, not, not a tenth, the first tenth. And it could have been one tenth of one tenth. It doesn't matter the amount. He said, John, the first tenth, the first tenth isn't yours, it's mine. Bring it into my storehouse in the New Testament context would be the local church. And so I, I give my tithe. You ain't given anything, it's not yours. You can't give what doesn't belong to you. You can only steal what doesn't belong to you. Tithing isn't giving. I know how much I gave last year when I tithed, not a penny, not to God. God said, that that's mine, you just didn't steal it. Every day of the world, every time money comes into my hand, I get a choice. Will I walk in humility or pride? 
but I need to work hard. I need to save. I need to, I need to, I need to. And he said, I resist the proud. It has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with, Father, I trust you. I yield to you. I put you first. I humble myself under your mighty hand. You can exalt my finances. Bring your grace, your supernatural grace into my financial world. You want a financial partner? The one who made all the stuff? He's a good one. But you don't do it to get the stuff. You do it because he's God. And you honor him. Lastly, I'll tell you this. When we die, I'm going to tell you what's our instructions. When all of it's settled, the first tenth, not it, the last, the first tenth is coming right here. Every penny of it. He said, then what are you going to do? Then we're going to have a bunch of offerings going to a bunch of places. And we're going to give a lot of money away. He said, but what about your children? I don't give my kids, I don't want to give my kids stolen money. Last thing I want to do on this earth when I'm gone is to give it to the kingdom of God. It's the last thing I want to do. It's the last thing when I'm gone, I want a ministry to go, man, uh, you know, John's dead, but man, Michelle, they're gone. But look at what they, I want to give. Not for their view, I'm gone. I want to, uh, God first in life, God first in death. It's the greatest thing you ever give your children is to learn how to live in this triangle. Let me pray for you today because if you're like me, yeah, it's sometimes not so simple. Because feelings, man, circumstances, oh man, they're loud. Boy, are they loud. And everything in you wants to say, God, I, I know what you said in your word or what you spoke to my heart about, but it's not possible. It just can't happen. Well, you're right on your own, but there's a way to live in divine capacity. What would happen if your life, in my life, if I truly lived in the fullness of the ongoing multiplication of the grace of God just through my life. It makes me so hungry to obey God because I know what stepping into his grace does and I know what it will do in your life. Take you places you never dreamed imaginably possible. You never even imagined that you end up there. I don't mean money. I don't mean stuff. I don't mean position. I'm talking about your life, your contentment, your heart, generational nonsense that butchered your family dies with you because his grace extinguishes all of the nonsense and the curse and the lie that's what he's called you to live this way in these next several months I'm just going to talk to you about how to live in the triangle we'll talk about a whole bunch of different stuff but as I prayed about this weekend as we wait on God at the end is of every service I always want to wait and see what the Holy Spirit wants to do because and we'll talk more about the gifts and, uh, and operation and manifestations of the Holy Spirit but there was one area that yesterday and even today keeps coming up in my heart that I want to pray for every person. Would you just bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. And we're going to be on our way in just a few moments. But uh, as I prayed about this, the Holy Spirit kept dealing with my heart. Today is our water baptism week. And, uh, and yesterday was the Freedom Retreat. That's why I have this shirt on. It's from the Freedom Retreat. And uh, it's where you go through a small group called Freedom. It's 13 weeks, culminates in the Friday, Saturday retreat. It is remarkable. And 29 people were water baptized afterwards. And then last night, 39 people <clears throat> were water baptized at the Saturday night service. And what came in my heart today is to give you the choice, a real life choice right now, right now, of to submitting to God, humbling yourself, and obeying God or choosing not to. It's not, a, it's not kind of this vague, it's a yes or a no. The, the scripture said Jesus himself was baptized. When he was baptized, John the Baptist said, Lord, I can't baptize you. And he said, John, do it because it, it, it's a requirement. It, you must baptize me to fulfill all righteousness and obedience. Jesus himself was water baptized as he went into his public ministry. And the scripture tells you that after you give your life to Christ, then you are to follow him in baptism. Where you go into the water dry, you are immersed and you come up wet. It's, a, it's an indication, an outward experience showing an inward working. I came to Jesus dead in my sin, immersed in him, and I came up a new creation in Christ. And every, every Christian is called to be, every, every, listen to me, every Christian is called to be water baptized. Every Christian. He said, well, I was done. that happened when I was a baby. That's wonderful, it's sacred, but it doesn't count because you didn't choose. Water baptism in the Bible is after you give your life to Jesus, you choose to make a public declaration of Jesus as the Lord of your life. And this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. Give people that opportunity today to follow me in baptism now. 
Now you get a real-time application in your life when you leave today of how you say yes or how you say no. And, it, and you say, what if I say no when I leave? Does that mean God's against me? No. It's just a perfect indication that God says something and something spoke louder to you. And until you learn to deal with that issue in your life, baptism or whatever, you will never live in the distribution of the power of God to the measure that you should. And before John Owens, Pastor John closes us in prayer, he'll dismiss any of you that want to be water baptized today, along with those that are already signed up. And we'll dismiss you right before everybody else. You go out there and there'll be people right outside these center tunnels. They'll, they'll show you where to get changed. We have clothing for you, towels to dry off with, hair dryers. You can leave just like you came, but you can leave fully obedient to God. And what happens when I get water baptized? More grace comes. Why? Because you submit yourself to God. More grace. So what would, what's it going to do in my life? I don't know. But let me ask you this. What would, what would you be unhappy if it did? It's supernatural endowment. I, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and he said, give people that real time opportunity to leave here either knowing they've submitted to me and humbled themselves or did not and lifted something above me. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you are a Christian, that is, you've already given your life to Jesus and you've never given your life to Christ, or I'm saying you have given your life to Jesus, but you have never followed Jesus and been water baptized since you've done that. You say, Pastor John, I want to be one of those people. I'm going to obey God today. Might be, oh, I don't know, we didn't plan for this. Always plan for obedience. And we'll give you the opportunity to do it right now today. So I just want to ask you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you've never been water baptized, maybe you're here as a couple. Lead your home, sir, lead your home. Grab her by the hand and say, baby, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna walk in the grace of God. We're going to do this as a family. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, I want to follow Jesus in baptism today. Just right where you're seated. This is between you you and God. I don't know. I'm not going to know whose names are who's what. Just raise your hand as as you say, I'm going to do that today and follow Christ. Just lift it high. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. Thank you. If you raised your hand or should have, when Pastor John Owens dismisses you, just slip out and they'll, they'll bring you back to that place. He said, but I, my, I feel badly. I'm not going to do it. I don't want you to leave feeling badly. I just want you to leave with the knowledge that something, something was risen above obedience in a very practical way. It's just that simple. That's how you do this. You say yes or no. It's that simple. So, said, well, what happens if I say no? God's full of mercy. He loves you. None of us do this perfectly. That's why he's full of mercy. But oh, I hope you say yes today. I hope you learn to practice this. It'll change your life. It will change your life and possibilities will bow their knee. Finally, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you have never given your life to Jesus or you are not sure, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you say to me, Pastor, please include me in a prayer to invite Jesus into my heart. I will pray for you right where you're seated. The whole church will pray that prayer out loud and together with you right where you're seated. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, I want to know that Jesus is the Lord of my life and I don't today. I want to invite him into my heart. We'll pray with you right where you're seated in just, just a moment. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just lift your hand high where I can see it and I'll pray for you. Do it right now. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. Thank you. If you were in the risers, I apologize. I can't see you clearly enough to acknowledge you, but if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud where you hear it. Jesus will come into your heart. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. I am so desperately passionate to see every one of us, including me, live in this triangle. There's no other way to live as a Christian. And I long to see you live that way. I long and I pray for you every day of the world that God would open your heart and understanding to live this way. Because this is what you were made for as a child of God. If you raised your hand or should have, pray this out loud where you hear it. Jesus will come into your heart. He's never going to leave you. And we celebrate with you. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father. I pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father. I come to you in Jesus' name. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my heart and life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give them a hand. Amen. God bless you.